years have been such a roller coaster ride for so many reasons, not just the pandemic, but what we've been seeing in media, what we've been seeing in terms of the injustice, and also for these really wonderful spaces where hard conversations have been occurring and changes have been occurring. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we're looking at, you know, this area of bias, these blind spots that we have. And that's a really hard thing to do. So I'm very, very excited about tonight's conversation and wanted to just jump right in and ask, why is why is language important? You know, we use it every day. We use it without thinking sometimes. <laughs> um, but tell us why you think it's important and what is systems-based language? Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's start there and then we can look more about, you know, how it's been formulated and some examples. Excellent. Excellent. I'm not a swimmer, but I'm ready to dive into this. So why is language important? Well, on a personal level, I love words, you know, as a, a writer, as someone who has been uplifted and healed by the written word. I think language has is just so powerful in terms of bringing the intangible pieces of our human experience into tangible form that we can share, right? Language is one of our higher order mammal faculties that once we capture it, it can like transport time, it can transport location. So it is really one of our skills, our gifts as humans. And for that reason, it's very powerful, right? Um, right. Language, however, also sets the frames that we use. What is a frame? Well, Kimberly Crenshaw talks about this a lot. She talks about how a frame is how you see the picture within it, right? Mm -hmm. You can also think of it as a lens. I'm a glasses wearer, so I'm very familiar with, you know, <laughs> if my lens are spotty or if they're getting old, I need a new prescription. So it, it really impacts how we see and if we see things. Right. Language can be a lens. Language is a frame already. So right. when we think about who's in charge of setting the frame, what is boxed out of a frame, then it gets really powerful, right? Think about just the frame of history. Who gets to tell the story of history, right? right. So that's why language is so important. It just goes beyond just words and it goes to how the words are used and how we understand our worldview because of those words being used. So it gets awesome. big fast. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And tell us a little bit more about what a systems-based language is, yes. um, you know, and what is uh, person-centered language and like, what does that look like? Yes. So um, one small tweak, I call it system-centered language instead of system-based. And that's important to me as, a, as words are. System-centered yes. language is, is what we're looking at because I found that when we're talking about people experiencing oppression, uh, people in different struggles and hardships, we center the individual. Like mm -hmm. this person did or didn't do that. When really we ought be centering the systems that give rise to that individual's behavior or choices or circumstance. Okay. So just as a quick reading, I'm going to just read a little excerpt that defines what system-centered language is, just a short paragraph. So <clears throat> here it is. System-centered language is a linguistic call to action that seeks to end the dehumanization of people that occurs while describing how they are experiencing oppression. Mm. The goal of system-centered language is to begin to reclaim through language the inherent value of these humans and place accountability where it is due, which is squarely on the interlocking, intergenerational, and very mm. present tense systems of tyranny and oppression, primarily racism, is the one I center in this article, right? Mm. And to answer your second part of that question, system-centered language isn't that new. Um, we already have person-first language in therapy mm -hmm. spaces. So some of us in the room may know and may already have incorporated this into our language where we say, um, instead of saying a depressed person or I got to meet with my schizophrenic three o'clock, that's right. so dehumanizing, right? We're kind of right. making the whole narrative of who that person is, their diagnosis. Right. So not too long ago, uh, person first language says a person with depression, right? right? Or a person who struggles with alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And you can almost hear automatically that humanizing shift, right? Mm -hmm. 
person who's struggling with this, not depression, right? So right. system-centered language attempts to do the same type of humanizing shift, but with the isms, racism, <laughs> sexism, uh, classism, putting the system first um, so we understand the context the person is living in. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for that definition. And I apologize if I'm like looking. Um, it just started raining super duper hard. <laughs> it's like, ah, is it going to interrupt? Um, I think like, you know, that example that you gave of how we shifted in the field to identifying a person first and then diagnosis first. Like, I love that we do that in the field and wish that it was being done more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm just very curious, like what led you to write your article on the systems centered language? Yeah. Yeah. A couple threads, right? When, and everyone listening can think of their own creative process. Um, sometimes I think of Adele. There's a funny joke about, you know, if Adele finds a happy relationship, are we never going to get any more good breakup songs or love turmoil <laughs> songs? Or, you know, my process for writing usually is something is pissing me off or something <laughs> has really harmed me emotionally mm -hmm. or there's some question or a curiosity that I can't quite answer. Mm -hmm. And it's usually around anger. So um, this piece was born out of a racial frustration uh, where you know, I was looking at where we were in the pandemic and it was early pandemic, right when some of the early CDC research had come out and said that the people most nice. susceptible and dying from COVID was black and brown communities, specifically mm -hmm. African-American. And not only was that wounding just because of the truth of it, but it mm -hmm. was also wounding because I knew that data was going to shift how people responded to COVID, right? It's right. not me. It's not my community. You know, right. much right. like we saw, you know, some younger communities, you know, being flippant when we found that it was older people that were right. you know, impacted. So I was stewing in that. I was also um, grateful to be a part of a weekly diversity, equity and inclusion training at my job. Mm -hmm. And each week we talk about really important topics. And we had just gone over the social determinants of health, right? Oh, yes. So I was stewing with all these, you know, does your area code matter more than your genetic code based on all the access to care, all these things. And this popped out of me out of a grateful rage because I was watching the news and I was seeing things like African-American communities are more vulnerable. African-American communities are all these different words. And I was mm -hmm. like, are we more inherently vulnerable? Right. And why is it that we're disproportionately impacted? So I remember writing down these key words, vulnerable, disproportionate, um, even things like historic, you know, some news channels and even articles from the APA would say people with historical uh, hardship or economic disadvantage are more likely to buff up up. And I'm like, is it historical or is it tense? <laughs> right? Why don't we just want to call it happening still now? Right. It was born out of the the cop out or the 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 waving of hands or the 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 smoke and mirrors. I thought the language we were currently using was actually doing right. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I wrote all these terms down. I wrote down what I felt like they were actually saying because when yeah. you say vulnerable and the way we use it, it makes it kind of connotates that a group of people are weaker. Mm -hmm. or less than, or uh, <clears throat> less than in some way, right? Instead mm -hmm. of actually just being more exposed to harm. Right. We know that Black people uh, live closer to factories and pollutants and food deserts. Mm -hmm. um, we know that they have more of those essential roles due to all the economic barriers. So they're actually more exposed or relegated to certain communities and areas where there is going to be more harm. Right. So it just came out of a fed up itness that how we're framing things isn't actually onerous to the experience. Right. I'm so glad that you like really broke that down. And what stands out is that nothing has really changed in terms of talking about, you know, the black experience. There's still this um this perception of the less than, whether it was you were treated like chattel or whether your brain is different because of the color of your skin and therefore you're less than, there's still that narrative. Um, 
And I, I talk a lot with my, my supervisees and my trainees about accountability and responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and neither of those <laughs> things seem to be coming to pass with that communication, right? And historical mm -hmm. trauma, like that's not centering it in a community or a group who caused it, or even mm -hmm. talking about what is the ramifications of it currently and how, mm -hmm. you know, there are privileges being, you know, continuously bestowed today. Yeah. Right. So I, I love how you broke that down and understanding your process of seeing these things. And, and even though it's out of anger, anger is all about action. Anger is not a bad emotion. It is good. It helps us motivate us. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you put all of this into writing, which is super helpful for us to be able to, to read and understand how the language is impacting, mm -hmm. not just the Black community, but mm -hmm. all of the isms that are out there. So this is like a jumping off point, right? Mm -hmm. So you're starting here and often, you know, we start in the Black community and look at other areas that are also being impacted. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about this, you know, you're writing about this, you're wanting to see change. What is the resistance that you see about changing the language in general? Why mm -hmm. would there be resistance? And what's the unconscious and conscious bias that is inadequately addressed? Mm -hmm. I'll start with some compassion. It's always a good place to start. Um, I guess the first layer of hesitance or straight up resistance is that change is hard, mm -hmm. um, be it a small personal change, but definitely a systemic change, right? Mm -hmm. Change is hard, right? It, there's, un, there's uncertainty, there's, um, you know, difficulty around, is this going to serve me, right? It's murky when we're in the change mm -hmm. process. So that's like kind of a compassionate human side. But on the real, real, there's another side that's like some people don't want to change, right? Mm -hmm. If the system is working for you as it is intact, why change it? And, and, and even more, I'm going to fight to protect it the way it is, right? So what, what this change would bring about is a kind of deconstruct, oh, actually an awareness of the system first. Mm -hmm. Like, well, here's this huge gears of how this works, spinning all behind us in the backdrop. Right. Turning and looking at that, is it can be dangerous to the system because then we'll know what to dismantle from it, right? right? And so when something can remain invisible, it can probably keep going humming as it wants to. So some people don't want to change. And then from there, some people don't want the accountability to change, right? I have to change the way I think. I have to change the way I act. I might have to change how I spend my money or how I interact with people or how I allow people to interact with me. So there's, there's reasons. Why people mm -hmm. don't change. <clears throat> I think, but, go ahead. No, you first. <laughs> I, I was just thinking of the whole NIMBY, not in my backyard, where there are advocates and proponents for change, so long as it does not <laughs> impact them in their space. And um, I think that's something that you're also speaking to that we're seeing in a, in a language based you know, experience. Mm -hmm. Like, there are a lot of people who are proponents for change until it comes to the individual. Okay close to home. Right. And am I right that NIMBY is mainly around homelessness programs and the, un the unhoused? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Near and dear to my heart. That's really where I started my work and my research was with unhoused folks. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's amazing. We're talking about language, but language represents so many different factors, right? So, okay. you know, even talking about homelessness versus unhoused and who is unhoused, psychological homelessness. It's just, I love words. And sometimes it's also like the bane of my existence because you sometimes you can't express something. So I, I totally appreciate that, the being able to address like from a compassionate standpoint, how difficult change can be, but then also addressing the real issue of how change is complicated and some people don't necessarily want to change. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how like our established psychological governing bodies like the APA or you know boards of psychology address systems language. And mm. you feel these bodies do a good job at dispersing information about this and about how language can impact, you know, folks and the work that we do? Mm. I should have done a little bit more homework because APA just came out, I want to say a month ago, 
with a little briefing. It had um, a little table about like updated language we can use Mm -hmm. um, around gender, around, you know, minority versus minoritized. Um, The term I've been using recently instead of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color is people of the global majority. Mm -hmm. Um, We could talk on another Thursday around how that is more empowering and uplifting and doesn't use mm-hmm. whiteness as the standard of where we right. fall into. Um, but they did send out a table. I thought it was a pretty good start. And I wanted, I put it on my to-do list, still haven't done it, to like send them a little, hey, what about all these other terms we could add, right? Um, <clears throat> so APA is trying. Um, yeah. APA's and this also APA's comes on the heels of their apology as well, right? So there are some efforts being made. Yes. They're going through it. I'll, I'll take the efforts. We just need more. And I'm actually very encouraged by having Dr. Tama on yes. at the helm next year. Yes. So yes. I am. I believe there's going to be a lot more in that direction. Um, but if I may, mm-hmm. um, I would like to read one more excerpt about change and pushback. Um, I think this captured it even better than I could recreate it now. So this piece from the System Center Language article says, A quick note on the inevitable pushback. Some will say this is not needed. Others will think it's too much work. I understand these objections to be part of the natural resistance to something new that will take effort and expanded consciousness. Ain't nobody got time for that. (laughs) I want to speak directly to those who will argue that this call to focus on the system is part of the problem. The problem of making people feel victimized and claiming victimhood Mm -hmm. as an excuse or an exemption from personal responsibility for their actions. As a psychologist, I believe that personal actions and autonomy are required sources of healing. This is not a grand cop-out. This is acknowledging the original source of the problem as Mm -hmm. we heal and hold our own smaller locus of control and accountability. Just as you would not tell a plant in non-nutrient soil that it simply cannot grow, we mustn't tell people suffering at the hands of oppression that they are inherently deficient. When we do, we we spend precious time solving the wrong problem and instilling internalized oppression in others. I understand that as a society, we do not like system level problems. It is much easier to blame the individual and disrobe ourselves from any onus and participation in the problem. But this dismissal simultaneously excludes us from participation in the solution, which requires all of us. We cannot dismantle what we dismiss. So I'll stop there. Love that. I I love that. Like the idea that if you just, you know, identify one problem and then you wash your hands of it, that I I did my part, right? But this is a collective, which I think is very different than the Western line of thinking where it's very individualized. And what you're saying is we really do need to use a collective approach and we need to be all at the table, um, not always all making decisions, (laughs) but being able to help point out what some of those blind spots are and make sure that those conversations are being had so that we can think together about how to move forward. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I always think about the, um, there's a, I want to say it's a Nigerian proverb, but I always see it listed as an African proverb. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's been part of the damage in this country. We constantly you know, focus on, on this individualized uh, perspective of do, 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 do. And there's so much burnout here. Um, we're not thinking collectively. Mm-hmm. And so I think going back to the question of the boards or the these governing bodies and communicating um, like how, what are we doing? How should we speak? How are we changing languages? Um, It's why we get these little excerpts of like, here's a few things that we can do because it's one person probably doing some Mm -hmm. review, maybe three people versus it being a collective of everyone coming to the table and addressing those Mm -hmm. those, those topics. Um, I would ask you, given your expertise, what suggestions or tips do you have to introduce systems-based learning or systems-based language in a way that people will be receptive to learning? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. 
I've had a couple experiences now with this. Um, so when I first wrote the article and kind of put it on LinkedIn and put it on my medium, I was really warmed by the responses from people. Um, some people that know me professionally as colleagues, but almost more warmed by people I didn't even know. So I had people that work in grant writing reach out and say, oh, I'm changed by this because every time I write a grant, I almost have to talk about people so disparagingly and so needily so I can get money. So right. now I can talk about their needs in a way that doesn't, you know, minimize them as a person. I was like, wow, that's awesome. I've had yeah. people reach out in the, from the addiction community and say, oh, we need that here because in addiction spaces, it's so individualized as their problem and their issue. So now we can kind of refurbish our guides and our models and even our group therapy and how we talk to people struggling with addiction directly to make right. it more empowering and uplifting. So what I've done is, and everyone can bring their own process to this. Some people aren't spreadsheet people, but every time I come across a headline or a description or something I hear in my everyday life that see, that just lands on me difficultly or angers me, that's always a good sign. I write it down and then see if I can flip it. I literally put on my systems lens and say, why is this happening? Why is this showing up this way? Like, how would I zoom out? and then describe this phenomena from the zoomed out lens, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, I saw an article not too long ago that said something like, um, I'll give you two examples. Um, it said, why are African-American uh, uh, work employees not being um, promoted at the rates of their counterparts? Mm -hmm. so I was like, okay, all right, that didn't land on me well. So how could I flip it? And so mm -hmm. I said, what in the what in corporate spaces is not promoting African American employees, right? Mm -hmm. Same content, same message of the headline, but taking it off of the back of the black employees and on the system of promotion, right? Right. I saw another article about why are black people not getting their vac vaccinations, right? So I flipped it to um, the cultural trauma around vaccinations, right? right. And there's a history often, right, in any individual or definitely group behavior. So right. what I would say to those listening, especially uh, trainees that are the future of our field, is to think, read what you read, come across what you come across, and then pause and think about it through the systems lens. You now have uh, some enough training and you already have the empathy to think about why are people behaving this way? Are there mm -hmm. any external, external systemic, systemic forces that are contributing and how could I center that? To, to rehumanize. I love that because you're in a way you're saying not to focus on just the behavior like you're seeing the person's actions as a reaction to something. So you're looking at the environment. What is it about the environment that is leading to this reaction versus what is it about this individual or this this group of people mm -hmm. um, which it's very, very interesting. I think if um, if we were, it, it's it's so intertwined with history. If we were to have that history, mm -hmm. and like going back to probably like the very late twentieth century to even early twenty first century, mm -hmm. um, you would probably hear a lot of that because within the 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 community, like I'm thinking of my grandmother and you know great family members like they didn't say what's wrong with that boy <laughs> what's wrong with that girl it was more about like what's happening in that family mm -hmm. you know that you know so and so is reacting this way um and so we've gotten so ingrained in focusing a problem in a person so i'm yes. i'm so glad that you're you're really parsing this out and helping people to identify that it's not just nature we went long time thinking it was nature, but it's nature and nurture. How are we making sure that we're holding both, mm -hmm. not just one? So, mm -hmm. so much appreciation for that. And just thinking yeah. of, you know, as you're doing this work, because you're saying to people, you have to do this work. You have to practice. This isn't something that's just going to come naturally. Yeah. Um, just kind of thinking about your role as a psychologist, being on the far front of advocating for systems, mm -hmm 
self-centered language. Um, how do you personally cope with the emotional labor of teaching something like this? Because this is this is pretty big. Yeah. Oh, I love the coping question, right? It's it's something I do need to prompt in myself more. And there's a, there are a couple ways I cope. Um, one is replenishing with other pioneers, other people mm -hmm. in the trenches with you. Um, mm -hmm. This is not lone wolf work. Um, it, you've got to have a relay mentality where you hand it off to other people. You are kind of working together. So I have a lot of colleagues and friends that do DEI work that that write a lot about the topic. And I just kind of check in with them. They check in with me and we ask about how we're doing. We also share, you know, our, uh, what do we call it? You know, those kind of nightmare stories where we get really bad questions from folks um, or we, you know, ha talk about how we remain poised um, when we're trying to field some things that really irk us. But we, we, we go together to the point of your, uh, your quote there, your proverb. That's one way. You got to stay thinking about how do I get replenished? You also take breaks. Mm -hmm. Breaks mm -hmm. are important, especially in advocacy work. So anyone listening that's an advocate in any any lane, right? Whether you're frontline, back of the house, um, you do need breaks, right? A break right. won't break you. And a break doesn't mean you're not down for the cause. So right. take breaks, long or short, replenish with others. But I also think uh, stay a learner. Right. Okay. Um, learn new things, fold it into your perspective in a field like this. There's so many ways to decolonize how we think. And since we all are steeped in these systems, white supremacy, right. capitalism, patriarchy, uh, heteronormativity, um, we all have foggy spots. And we got to just remain humble when someone points out a new one because we don't know what we don't know. And so I keep learning. I journey with others and I take good breaks. So, you know, you talked about having your collaboration with others and making sure you take breaks. Where would you recommend that therapists go to receive that same support until like their organization or official, um, you know, groups adopt this line of communication? I don't want to just say it's a line of thinking because mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things that people think and don't speak on, but like this line of communication. So what resources would you recommend that um, clinicians reach out? Yeah. So there might not be very many formal resources, but I almost feel like informal resources sometimes do a better job because because of their informality, they get to kind of uh, be what they need to be. Um, so this is going to sound odd, but TikTok. I have a lot of friends on TikTok that are also talking about these topics, have put it to dance, have put it to humor, have just really uh, almost discharge some of their frustrations or their joys through a more creative process. Mm -hmm. uh, Medium is another great place for other writers to go and share thoughts and have little forums, um, but also your own community. So let's say your department or your organization isn't hip to this yet. Um, that doesn't mean you can't stay the course, mm -hmm. but even within that, there might be a colleague or two that believes or shares and wants to speak the way you do. And you can start there. So quality over quantity is what I would really recommend, even if it's just one other, even if it's long distance. Mm -hmm. I have a friend in Canada, a black therapist up there um, who's really holding it down. Um, and even though I've never met her in person, this is the good side of the Internet where <laughs> you can stay connected with people you haven't met yet. Yes, yes. I, I love that you said quality versus quantity, because I think often um, this is something that we as human beings do. We look for a lot of resources and the number of resources actually, you know, tells you that you're you know an expert in the field or expert in this area. And in reality, it's not. It's mm -hmm. especially nowadays, <laughs> like there's the benefits of the Internet and then there's the challenges where there's too much information and some mm -hmm. of it is not quality. So really, you know, looking at the quality of information is really important. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that with not just clinicians, but also thinking about our clients and you know the quality of information that they are getting and what happens when we clinicians aren't keeping in mind the system centered approach and what mm -hmm. impact the systems are having on uh, those individuals so what impact do you think that our clients are experiencing or have when we as clinicians are not using a system centered approach yes this is actually a pretty big question. 
because unlike some other impacts that might be more iconic, for example, if we didn't assess for SI, that would probably be very bad if we missed uh, someone who was going to self-harm. Or if we didn't assess someone's substance use, um, that could get out of hand and have very detriment, obvious detrimental effects. But sometimes, because most of us have been taught and groomed up in a very individualist, um, a pathology-based mm-hmm. kind of um, psychological upbringing, um, a lot of times when we don't center the system in our clinical work, it might not go it goes unchecked. Maybe our supervisors aren't saying anything. Our clients are in the position where they're already coming for us to help for help. So they might not be looking to check us on this. Um, and there is that power differential. So right. in some ways they're open to our interpretations, or our perceptions. So, but when we don't center the system, we actually perpetuate the system, right? And that is a real harm to mm-hmm. our clients. For example, <clears throat> if I have a black graduate student, which I often have, and they're telling me about their depression or mm-hmm. they're about to graduate and they're finding themselves morose because they don't want to go into academia after their whole experience in academia. <laughs> and I say, well, you know, that's your best option. That's what you've been grooming yourself to or academia is just hard. Ignoring the fact that academia is not just hard. It can be uh, dangerous and harmful mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. black students. So if I just miss that part, I'm she's going to walk away from session thinking, oh, I need to stick it out or what's wrong with me that I can't do this. But when I am able to say, hey, academia ain't fun for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. How many black professors do you see and how long do they stay? When mm-hmm. I give her the numbers of turnover or other careers that black folks with her degree have thrived in, then whenever you center the system mm-hmm. and take that burden off of somebody, options open up, um, right. worldview opens up. And especially for these highest achieving Stanford students, they stop solving the wrong problem, which is fixing themselves. And right. they can get about um, what's actually going to be service in service of their wellness. So yeah. you can just miss the mark sometimes. I, I do want to see like the numbers in the future of like the impact and the reduction in suicidality mm-hmm. when we start looking at the center versus or centering the system versus looking at the individual um, and even in substance abuse, right? Like substance abuse, I love someone explained um, that the focus is all about, you know, feeling like you're getting everything you need from the substance. Right. Versus being able to connect without getting everything you need from the community. And in essence, what you're talking about is helping people recognize what's happening in the community where this person is responding, either rejecting the community Mm -hmm. or going into it. So I I really do love how we can look at the this particular lens Mm -hmm. and begin to think about so many different challenges that really could be addressed by just a flipping of our language. Just click it in. Yeah. Right. Yes. And do the hard work, right? Because there might be systems like, well, I'll take um, uh, heteronormativity as a straight person. There are pieces of privilege that I have that I don't have to navigate. So when I learn just how stacked the system is for heterosexual people, it can be hard to enter into that. Right. right. Um, and have to understand that the world is not kind to anyone not straight. And so you have to when you think about liberation psychology and there's that that mindset of accompaniment. Mm-hmm. Can you accompany someone in the truth of their the world and how it is for them in their mm-hmm. constellation of identities? It's a lift. It is yes. A lift. Mm-hmm. And you, you have to be OK with not knowing. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's an, another challenge for many people in our country where you're so taught you have to know as much or know everything but even thinking about liberation psychology you have to be willing to be informed or to be taught like you can't always be in the lead uh so i really appreciate how this lens really opens the opportunity for discussion Mm -hmm. and it equalizes the opportunity for many people to in to join into that discussion Mm -hmm. um one more thing I want to say about substance use since we're sharing profound knowledge in that subject. Um, I remember reading that 
alcohol and marijuana, these aren't the gateway drugs. Trauma <laughs> is the gateway. Right. right? People are using substances to probably escape from some pain. So maybe we should talk about the pain they're escaping from. Right. So it's just it's just so more compassionate to understand that. Yeah. And it, it, it just, it opens the doors for so many things. And it's one of those things where, you know, people are going to say down the line, probably like five, 10 years ago, like, yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. And like, who would know, like who would have thought to say it any other way, but <laughs> they're missing all of the efforts and the work that has to be done. And they're, you know, just sitting in it. So I can't wait to get to that place, but also recognizing there's a lot of work to be done. Um, just kind of going back to that, that the equality in the conversation, um, I just wanted to think about like how we're trained and how we learn in grad school, like not to impose your beliefs, not to, you know, basically how to become essentially a blank slate, right, for our client. Um, you know, with that being in mind, how can we work to not impose our biases on our clients, but still be in a space of continuous reflection Ooh. so that we are using the system-centered language? Um, how do you recommend clinicians challenge their unconscious bias so that they can do healthy work and be in that place using that particular lens? Mm. Love this question. And there's multiple ways in. So in no particular order, I would say that somewhere around the early steps would to be just to accept and embrace that you have bias. Um, I don't know. Some people uh, want to think that the more they learn, the less they're biased about. Um, <laughs> not the case. If anything, the more you learn, the more biases you're likely to have. Because if it doesn't fit into you know, the little confines of what you your knowledge as you might form more biases. So know that you have some already just from your upbringing, right? Um, And then to be willing to be that lifelong learner we talked about. So every client you have is going to teach you something new if you're engaged and awake enough to to receive that. But I wanted to give just a quick definition of bias because it's used a lot. um, And I just want to make sure we're thinking of it the same. Mm -hmm. So bias is a disproportionate weight in favor, <clears throat> let me see, in favor or against an idea or thing, usually in the way that it's closed minded, prejudicial, or unfair. Bias can be uh, innate or unlearned, and people may develop bias for or against an individual or group or belief. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we all have these. And I think one good way to just stay hip to what your client is telling you is. To, you can lead with what you are aware of, and what mm-hmm. your world walk has taught you, but always leave it open for other elements to be true, right? Mm-hmm. But let's go to the blank slate before I give an, an example of what that can look like. I will say that um, I identify as a cognitive behavioral therapist. I love CBT, still do. But as soon as I learned about liberation psychology, I was like, oh no, this is it. This is really <laughs> where the magic happens. And mm-hmm. Come to find out, just as a Black person, I had been doing similar elements to liberation psychology just because it felt more true, right? Mm-hmm. And so now me and a couple of colleagues are creating LCBT, liberation-infused mm-hmm. CBT, right? Um, but with that, I want to say the blank slate, I don't think, is very humanizing, right? Mm-hmm. Part of what heals our clients is our humanity with them, mm-hmm. right? So if I don't cry, like yesterday when I just spoke to a client who lost her dad suddenly, if I don't allow myself to tear up and feel that, Mm -hmm. or if I don't appropriately self-disclose certain things, then it is like talking to a blank slate and you don't get that humanity. So for our trainees in the room talking about this, who are probably bristling at the thought of (laughs) crying with the client or sharing their own personal life, because we like to keep it clean when we're learning, um, An example of this would be, I can say to a client, um, so this experience you're talking about, it's, I've heard it's like this, but what is it like for you? So Mm -hmm. then you bring in your expertise or what knowledge you have about a situation, but you always leave room for the client. So for example, I was working with a East Asian client 
And I was like, well, you know, a lot of my other East Asian clients have told me their parents are very affectionate. But what was it like growing up in your house? And then she's like, oh, yeah, all Asian parents are X, Y, Z. And I'm like, yeah, but what was it like for you? So sometimes your client will give you a bias to operate mm-hmm. with. And you can still ask what it's like and or checking in with the client. Like, mm-hmm. um, did I miss anything or did I not ask you anything that feels more mm-hmm. resonant or that would explain your situation or experience that I just haven't asked yet? I love that catch-all question, especially mm-hmm. when I'm sitting across from someone with more, a lot of differences between us, because there may be things I just don't know, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I love that. Just making space to have that open dialogue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in talking about being a blank slate, I, and one, one of my supervisees had brought this to, to me, and it's like, well, we have to be a blank slate. And I was like, when have you enjoyed talking to a wall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when? Like, nothing there that that's not reflective and i i'm i'm traditionally trained in psychoanalytic psychotherapy and i totally understand the path tabula rasa and but there's got to be some humanity right and there's been a lot of changes just like there's been a lot of changes in cbt there's been Mm -hmm. evolutions and so we've got to stick with the times and most importantly In therapy, it's about the rapport. So opening the door for the conversation, no matter what background you come from, like you've got to be able to help them explore and feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if you're a blank slate. You can't do that if you're at wall. Um, So Mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thoughts are um, in terms of what the risks are when we don't Mm -hmm. use the system-centered language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the examples that come to mind are like death versus murder, um, historical versus current. Like, mm-hmm. what do you see as being a problem in that? Yeah, yeah. Another one I'll throw in there is disproportionate. Now, if you're a statistician, disproportionate means, you know, there's a uh, uncanny finding in the data when one proportion came out larger than the other. And right. That's what we're looking to. But usually disproportionate um, means, oh, this group is have it has more prevalence than something than another group. So, um, black women have a disproportionate infl- infant mortality rate, right? I think when it's used in that case, disproportionate is the signature of the system. There's mm-hmm. some system mm-hmm. why black moms are having these types of deaths, right? right? Why do we have more diabetes? These types of things. So when we don't call a spade a spade, we the the main risk is that we still live with these blinders on, right? right. Um, and then we're not putting any energies to actually pulling this up by the root and actually solving what's going on. You know, it's not historic, it's present. It's not disproportionate, it's systemic, right? Right. Because when you hear disproportionate, it's like, oh, it's too bad for that group. But when you hear systemic, you're like, oh, snap, something's being done onto them. Right. And could it be that this thing that's being done onto them could not be done onto them? And now you're on the right track. So the yeah. biggest risk is that no awareness no energy gets put into solving the problem. Right. And I, that per- perfect example, and I can never remember the name of the uh, author, but with the infant mortality rate, they looked at um, first, second, and third generation um, immigrants who had immigrated from different parts of like Africa, different parts of um I want to say Haiti and there's different different countries and different islands. Mm-hmm. And they looked at at what time point hmm. do you start to notice changes in the infant mortality rate, you know, just with immigrants. One year, I think, was the not one year, um, one generation was the amount of time. So for an immigrant who immigrated to the States and then had a child. Um, that child's experience of being in this country and being identified as Black increased their infant mortality rate significantly. And so when you think of like, what is it about Black people or that community, they're, you know, it's not just the people, it's the mm-hmm. systems. And so I love that that article came out and I, I'm so sorry that I can't remember the name of it. That's okay. that. I'm going to look forward. I'll definitely look for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love that you're talking about how focusing on the system helps us to understand what is happening for this group and that it's not an inherent behavior or inherent problem in the group. 
Um, so again, focusing on that language is really important, especially as we're talking about the group. Um, in addition, so not using, you know, um, system-centered language reinforces those stereotypes. And I'm wondering for your, just about your thoughts on how we can come together to thwart the insidious nature of media on reinforcing non-system, you know, centered language, because it's, you know, it's rampant mm -hmm. and, you know, we can't always police it, but there's so much out there. So what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I haven't been asked this question. Let me collect my thoughts because sometimes when it comes to media, I kind of throw up my hands. Other people <laughs> are championing that space. Um, and I will say, I think media doesn't really want to change. Um, for it, the media might be in the camp of staunch stay the same because it's more provocative. It fits with the powers that be. Um, it pits people against each other. Um, I just think it's just well worn in the groove of status quo. Mm -hmm. um, but I also believe in individual agency. So on a personal level, the very last thing I say in the article is like, think about the language you use as an individual. Think about the language your family uses and your peers use. And try to think about slowly incorporating your own and changing your own language. And those closest to you, you know, kind of grassroots out, will say, hey, why did you say it that way? People of the global majority, why don't you just say BIPOC or minoritized people? Why not minority? And then mm -hmm. that's a conversation between you and that person. Mm -hmm. And the hope is it will start a virtuous ripple of awareness and hopefully people trying it out in a different way. Mm -hmm. I know personally when... Um, my LGBT friends, you know, didn't want me to say gay anymore. Oh, that's so gay. And I stopped. And then my other straight peers would see me stopped and like ask them not to say that around me. They're like, well, you're not gay. And I'm like, yeah, but even though I'm not gay, it doesn't, I don't like that anymore. And so it started a conversation, right? And then in your own writing, professional or otherwise, start using the terms that feel more in alignment to the truth of the situation. Mm -hmm. and the more people see it, just exposure kind of can magnify over time. But if we're thinking news media, that's that's going to be a harder one. And I'm going to look to the people in the room to the chance to take that torch. Uh, there's an amazing quote uh, from Denzel Washington, of all people, who talks about, um, you know, how there's such a pressure to be first as opposed mm. to being right. And mm. so, you know, like he said, if you read the news, you're miss. You read the news, you're misinformed. You don't read the news, you're not informed, I think was his his quote. And they were like, well, what do you do about that? He's like, that's a good question. That's for you guys to figure out as journalists. Like, you know, the pressure to be first is what's been so damaging. So we need to look at accuracy and not always writing shorthand, not always just kind of getting at something super quick, like really yeah. taking our time. Um, accuracy and humanity. Right. That part has fallen flat out. Right. Uh, you can only get two of the three uh, of the triangle, speed, accuracy, and uh, cost effectiveness. Ooh. So I, I think we, we've got to kind of put that to the side and start thinking about making sure that accuracy and not speed is, mm -hmm. is on the table. Mm -hmm. um, so just given all everything that we've shared, and I know we are just about time, so Ooh, we'll, I'll, I'll wrap this up really quickly. Um, can you yep. share with us a success story pertaining to using system-centered language? Yes. I would say one of my favorite success stories is out of Ohio, um, where the Ohio Victims Substance Advocates Group, I did a two-part training with them all about what system-centered language is. They had homework in between the two sessions. And then we've kind of rewrote their welcome manual for incoming clients with substance struggles. So it just was a new paradigm on how they describe their clients, how they taught clients to describe themselves, all system language infused. Um, and now they're collecting data kind of pre-language shift and post on mm -hmm. how well their clients might do, right? Um, so things like that really give me hope. I'm going to be working with some grant writers on how to write about a struggle without making the person so dejected and needy uh, in order to get the grant funding. So those are success stories to me where little tweaks represent people in their humanity with their value intact. 
I love that. And hopefully those who are reviewing the grants start to ask yeah. people to write from this lens. So, you know, we're not um, dismissing grants because we're looking at a systemic issue. Because a lot of people are terrified of working in systems because they're like, it's going to take too long. But the the reality is, if we want change to happen, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I have totally missed a comment because we were just chatting along. Um, but we had a viewer ask a question. <laughs> Melissa asked, isn't the point of keeping us so busy, mm. too busy, a productivity distraction? Mm, so, uh, Alexa, stop. Sorry. <laughs> um, I have a point. <laughs> Um, didn't mean for that to happen, but yeah. um, her point was, you know, it's a predictive productivity distraction so that we don't come together, you know, thinking of higher consciousness. So I think that was a great point. I wanted to make sure I shared that. Melissa, I am with you on this and I could get on my whole soapbox about <laughs> redefining what productivity is. The most productive thing you can do is be about your wellness. Reclaim your worth, reclaim your wellness, and not get caught in this hamster wheel. Because you're right, when we're all, when we're only trying to produce as if we're machines, we don't have time to cohese, connect, get the clarity, find out who we are, and work on the things that most matter. So yeah, I think it's uh, by design that we're all too stressed to be about these most important work. Please.